Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. You would think that this far into a series we'd all understand what laser cutting is. I mean let's face it the first thing you do when you turn your machine on is select a power, select a speed, chuck a piece of wood or paper or card into the machine and you cut. Simple isn't it? You, know, you don't have to know anything you just select a few parameters and magically the machine does what you expect it to do but it turns out that I and quite a lot of other people don't actually understand what laser cutting is or let's put it this way at one stage I didn't um, I've got a pretty good idea now and so what I'd like to do in this session is to collect together all my experience and try and condense what laser cutting is in its scientific manner but don't get worried about the word science because I'm not a scientist. I will keep it very simple and we will explain some fairly complex and probably relatively unknown science subjects to you guys in very simple terms that will enable you to understand exactly how your machine works. Now the problem is over time I've collected all these little bits of information about the various aspects of cutting and they're all logged away in here as little pictures which I run together and merge when I want to solve a problem. Sometimes I speak about them as though you already know this stuff but it's quite likely that you don't. So today we're going to start from absolutely square one and we're going to talk about how this laser machine actually cuts material. Now it isn't just a matter of understanding how the laser itself works because the problem is a lot more complex than just the laser. It also requires a knowledge and understanding of material science as well. Hang on, I've used that word again, science. Trust me, I'm not a material scientist either. <laughs> Several years ago when I owned a sheet metal working business, uh, part of that was having two three kilowatt metal cutting CO2 laser machines. I thought I knew quite a bit about laser cutting because I had these machines for 10 years, programmed them and played with them and did a bit of servicing on them. But when I came to playing with this Chinese non-metallic cutting machine, I realised I didn't know anything about laser cutting at all. I knew how to laser cut, but that's not the same as understanding what laser cutting is. Here we've got a single blade that cuts right through the material in one go. That is not how laser cutting works. That material is only just barely sitting in there. What happens if I try to cut it? <laughs> yeah, I know I'm being stupid. The point I'm really making here is it requires resistance between this blade and this material to effect a cut. There is a force required, a mechanical force required for this sort of cutting. So we now know that it's nothing like using a saw. Okay so here I've got my little bench milling machine and I'm going to cut into this piece of wood in a different way. So I've produced a cut in there by a completely different method. It's still mechanical but it's by a rotary motion. So it requires stiffness in the assembly. This is not how laser cutting works either. Now, what I'm going to do now is much, sim much more similar to how laser cutting works, but not in this mechanical way. So let's do it again. So look, we're going to produce the same width of slot that we just produced. You get the idea. We've basically produced a slot by working in from the top and cutting down into the material. Little by little, moving along, cutting down, moving along, cutting down. That's as close as I can get to describing how a laser machine works. But a laser machine doesn't require all this. If I want to cut with a laser machine, 
I don't need any support. Right, we have our same piece of material here. Look, it weighs half of nothing. And I've just laid it on the table there. And look, let's just cut it in half cleanly without any force at all on it. So one of the big things about laser cutting is it is forceless. And the reason why it's forceless is because we are cutting with light. To make it even more confusing, we're cutting with invisible light. If you're watching this and you haven't got a laser machine, then you might be interested to see that across here, there appears to be nothing until I press the button and start the machine going. Wow, where did that come from? Trust me, if the machine was running, I would not want to put my hand just in there. Obviously you'll know about the laser machine in principle. The laser tube sits across the back and the light that it produces, the invisible light that it produces, bounces off of mirrors and finally finishes up down here. And just at the bottom here, we have one of these things, which is a lens. And the lens takes this very crude beam, it then bounces down here and gets focused down through a lens. We should find that we've got a very small hole. We move down slightly and a little bit more and then further and further and further and further and further. And there we go, look, we start off quite big, close to the nozzle, then we start focusing down until we get a fairly small point and then we get bigger again. Now, it's when the light is at its smallest point that you arrange to put that smallest point of light onto the surface of your material. And that's the, what they call the focal point, and you put the focal point onto the surface of the material. It's what happens underneath the focal point that really causes cutting. But before we get that far, what we need to do is establish how is it possible to burn the paper with a beam of nothing. Now, light is a very funny thing. It has no mass, but somehow it has energy. Now, I'm not even gonna get into the science of light, but if you want to know a little bit more about light in general, go and look up the electromagnetic spectrum, and you will see that there's a whole range of things that you recognize from radio waves, X-rays, um, microwaves, um, ultraviolet rays, infrared rays. In one section of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, you will see that there's a rainbow, colors, and they're things that our eyes are sensitive to. We are picking up light waves with our eyes. Now, at the moment, you're looking at this image here and you can see all sorts of different colors. Well, the only reason you can see different colors is because there is white light, random frequencies of light, disappearing into this scene, coming at it from all directions randomly. And why you see that as mauve is because all of the colors that are in the white light, and white light is made up of a lot of different colors, the only color that's being reflected is the mauve. The pinks, the greens, the blues, and the yellows, they're all being absorbed by whatever is in that surface there and not bouncing back at you. You see color by lack of absorption of light. You only see the reflected colors that do not get absorbed into that surface. So each one of these is absorbing a different range of colors from the white light that's firing at it. It gets even worse because what we're talking about here is invisible light. It's not even light that we can see. 
but it's exactly the same as the light that's hitting these objects here, but a different, but at a different frequency. And what is that frequency? Well, <clears throat> the light is a wave. Okay, and the distance between the peaks of that wave for this machine, the light that's in this machine, is 10.6 microns and if that wants to make any sense I don't know whether you can see my hair there but that's probably around about 25 or 30 microns so even though you can't see this light it has got some physical dimension you know what frequency is it's the number of pulses that we get here per second so the number of cycles per second happens to be something like about 28 thousand billion cycles a second. That's a pretty high frequency. And it just so happens that that frequency has an effect on something else that we can't see. If I draw this It looks like a little universe, the sun with planets revolving around it. That's an atom. And everything in this universe, everything that you see and touch is made up of atoms. Now, the paper is made up of a different combination of atoms to this piece of plastic. And so now, let's just Im imagine that we've got big atoms, small atoms, and they're all joined up with forces which are a bit like electromagnetism and they stick together to make something called a molecule. So every material that you find that's not something called an element and an element is a raw base material that cannot be anything other than itself. Things like copper, tin, you can't get anything other than tin. It doesn't break down into anything else. But paper is made up of all sorts of different molecules. This is made up of all sorts of different molecules. So, you know, steel is made up of different molecules. So everything is made up of atoms and molecules. And the thing about atoms and molecules is they don't sit still. They're always vibrating. And the vibration that they have is a measure of their temperature. So if a molecule is vibrating faster, it's hotter. Or put it another way, if you want to heat a molecule up, you make it vibrate faster. So this is a very basic concept that they don't normally teach you at school. And that is that temperature is measured by the vibration level of a molecule or an atom and it just so happens that this frequency that we've got here this incredibly high 28,000 billion cycles a second can excite these things and make them vibrate even more so when we fire light be it invisible or not but this is a very special form of light that we've got on this machine called a laser beam. And basically what it is, it's a form of light where all the waves coming out of the laser are all exactly the same. They're all completely synchronized together. Light waves on their own are not dangerous. As you can see, look, I'm being hit with them all the time. When you make them march together effectively like an army, all completely in step, they become very powerful and that's what our laser beam is. It's a beam of light where all the waves are fully synchronized. It's called a coherent beam of light. Now because it's one frequency, not a mix of frequencies, it's also called monochromatic, one color. I know we can't see that color but it's, that's basically what it's called. The frequency that we are using is in what they call the infrared 
the IR region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what we've got, we've got powerful light which is operating at this very very high frequency and it's shaking molecules and if we shake molecules and make them vibrate faster they get hotter. Now the misconception is that the laser beam is a beam of heat. No it's not a beam of heat. It might look as though it's a beam of heat because it burns things. But it burns things because what happens is the molecules in this paper have been vibrated so hard that they shake themselves to pieces. They cannot exist in the form of paper anymore. And what happens is some of these molecules fly off they will join things like oxygen that are in the air around us and they will produce smoke and fumes and then if we look carefully what we shall find is we've also produced this stuff in the background look ash so we've converted chemically converted this paper from one form of chemistry to another form of chemistry some of it's disappeared in the form of smoke, some of it's remained there in the form of ash, and some of it is just scorched paper. So that is the basic way in which this machine operates. So the way to imagine that beam of light is a bit like a stone falling from the sky. That stone is completely harmless until it hits you and then it changes its energy from kinetic energy to something that ouch hurts <laughs> the same with the beam of light the beam of light is completely harmless until it hits a solid surface and that's the important thing I want to re you to remember a solid surface contains molecules and those molecules then start vibrating and the faster they vibrate, the hotter they get. And the hotter they get, at some stage, temperature will exceed their capability to exist as whatever they are, be it paper, plastic, and the molecules will fly apart and they will reconfigure themselves into a different material. So that's cutting by a chemical reaction. Now, there is another form of cutting which you will come across on this machine. Acrylic is a very special form of plastic. It, there's nothing else like it except H2O, which I'm sure everybody understands what H2O is. This is effectively the same as a piece of ice. At room temperature here, this is like a piece of ice, a solid block of ice. At 160 degrees C, this will change to liquid in the same way that ice changes to water at zero to one degree C. It just instantly changes to water. And then with water at 100 degrees C, it boils and changes again into steam. H2O is the chemical symbol for ice, water, or steam. The same applies to this stuff. It does not change its chemistry. It only changes its state. It goes from solid to liquid to boiling. And it's cut it with a beautifully clear crystal surface. And the reason why is because just behind the cut there is liquid at 160 degrees C to 200 degrees C which remains in the cut and flows across the surface to make the surface wonderfully smooth. So that's a process of cutting by evaporation rather than by chemical change. It's still being done in exactly the same way by heating up and vibrating the molecules. I'm going to try and press this pulse button to get a very very short pulse of energy onto the surface there. Now that was a very very short pulse as you saw but you'll notice that the beam diameter is what? Four millimeters diameter? Now I'll hold it on a little bit longer and you'll notice that the beam has now grown 
a bit more. And you notice what's happening in the center of the beam. Watch it very carefully. Did you see that very, very bright white light right in the center? I looked at that and I've got spots before my eyes as though I've been looking at the sun. There was a very, very, very white light right in the center there. And you'll notice around the outside how it's not burnt in the same way as at the center. That's because the beam of light is not uniform. The beam of light coming from the laser in the form of these red lines is straight, just like this. But unlike the light that you see around you, it is not random, because remember, it's all completely what they call coherent. But not only is it coherent, it's not uniform. And what we've got here is a graph of the light intensity within the beam itself. So you can see here that the light intensity right at the center of the beam is more than it is right at the outside of the beam. The greater the intensity of the light, the more damage it can do. Remember what we saw here? The center was very, very bright white. Around the outside was not damaged as much. Because there's less light intensity around the outside of the beam, it takes longer to cause the damage. The best example that I can give you of this exposure time, in other words, the more intense the light, the less time it takes to damage the surface. The lower the intensity of the light, the longer it takes. If that was a candle flame, I could probably do that with my hand. And I would feel the heat, but it would not damage my hand. If I did it very, very slowly, like this, I can guarantee that it would burn my hand. My skin has got what they call a damage threshold. Remember, it's the molecules in my skin that are being aggravated and heated by the candle flame. And at a certain point in time, something will happen they will reach a damage threshold and something will happen. In this case, it will burn and it will smell like frying bacon. So we regard that as being exposure time. So if I expose my skin to a low heat at slow speed, I can do damage. Because the exposure time to that heat is enough to build up and damage my skin. If I turn that into a blow lamp now, I couldn't do that because the intensity of the heat has doubled, for example, and therefore I've got to double the speed to keep the same exposure of heat to my skin. So the lower the intensity, the more time we have to give for that energy to do damage. We then go to the next stage where we take this energy and we pass it through a lens. And as we pass it through a lens, what we're doing, we're really amplifying this energy and squashing it down. I mean, look, just say for example, we've got 60 watts of energy there. That's what this machine delivers. Just because we compress the light down to a very, very small spot size at the focal point, and if we call this, for example, six millimeter beam, and the spot size 0 0.06 millimeters, that means we've amplified this by a factor of 100. Now, what has that done to the intensity? I've drawn a baseline here, which is equivalent to that blue baseline. And what I'm now going to do is to try and show you what happens to this light intensity when it gets to here. We squashed it down to 0 0.06. That's a factor of 100, as I said, between 0 0.6 and 6 millimeters. So let's assume that this here is now 0 0.06 and not 
six millimeters. So if I take that and I multiply that zero by a hundred, it's still going to be zero. So the extremities are still going to be zero. And if I take this point here and I multiply that by a hundred, that's no longer going to be that much. It's going to be up here somewhere like this. So here's the beginning of my graph after it has passed through the focal point. Now look, if I multiply that height there by 100, it's going to be already off the edge of the paper. And by the time I get to here, right at the tip, it's going to be somewhere over the other side of the workshop. In other words, the intensity, and I keep using this word intensity because that's the most important word when you're talking about light. Intensity equals damage. The more intensity, the more damage you can do. So this, after the focal point, this might only be 0 0.606 diameter across here, like that, but it has got an intensity which is way off the scale. So remember, we're amplifying the whole of the beam, but we're not changing the shape of the beam. That means the central core of this beam is being intensified by a huge amount. And it is the core of this beam which, is you, which you're using to do damage to your work. This stuff on the outside here is only going to scorch. It's, it's not going to cut. So what I shall do, I shall remove the lens. Now you remember that I said to you that acrylics have got some strange properties. It doesn't cut by chemical means, it cuts by evaporation. The higher the intensity of light in that beam, the more it will evaporate the material. Now I'm going to add some air to this because it will probably catch fire otherwise. And if I show you what's happened, you'll notice that the centre of the beam is cut deeper than the edge of the beam. The greater the intensity, the more the damage, the faster you can do damage. And for that speed, there's more damage being done at the centre than there is at the edge. Now at this point, you've got most of the basic concepts how this machine cuts. But those basic concepts boil down to probably about six vital pieces of information. Now there are six pictures that I was telling you about that sit in my mind. And depending on the problem, we jiggle these six concepts around to answer the questions that arise. Now we're going to go through very quickly a summary of what those concepts are and then we're going to take them further because these are the concepts. This is not cutting. This is only the concepts for cutting. Well, as we started the whole thing off with, molecular vibration equals temperature. Remember, the faster things vibrate, the hotter the molecules are. Or conversely, if you can heat, if you can vibrate the molecules faster, you make them hotter. That's a basic science principle that you must never lose sight of. Now, the reason the CO2 laser works so well is because of the particular frequency of the light waves that it works with. 28,000 billions of cycles per second. And that particular frequency is broad enough to basically cause virtually every material to vibrate. Vibrating a molecule makes it heat up above what I class as a critical temperature. It will either burst into flames, it will turn into smoke, it will turn brown, 
it will evaporate, it will do something because every material has its own damage threshold. Now some materials like wood have got multiple damage thresholds like paper for instance which is a sort of wood the first thing that happens is it scorches and then the cellular lignin structure disappears at about 350 degrees C and what you're left behind is carbon and that's what this black stuff is in here look this is carbon and you'll notice that underneath the carbon layer we've still got bare wood carbon vibrates very very easily and it will heat up to about over 3000 degrees C and on its way up to 3000 degrees C it'll mix with um, the oxygen in the air to produce carbon monoxide and at higher temperatures it'll produce carbon dioxide so all the way up the temperature range to 3000 or more than 3000 degrees C it will change it to different chemicals so there's not just one change there are many different thresholds for some of these changes and of course what we saw in the center there was a very 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 bright light and that light is basically a carbon arc a bit like a welding arc the greater the light intensity the faster the molecules will be excited if you put water over a low heat it'll take a long time to boil if you put water over a very high heat it'll boil quickly that's effectively what we're talking about there now this is a very very important concept number five material damage basically the amount that you're exciting the molecules is dependent upon intensity as we mentioned in four but it's also related to time remember my candle flame example time speed the slower I go the more I'm likely to burn my hand so we're talking about exposure time here there are two key words that we need to associate with laser cutting and that's why I've marked up these two key words here one of them is light intensity and the other one is exposure time and finally something that you must always remember light can only excite surface molecules remember the stone hitting you on the head example it hit you on the head it didn't go through to your heart and stop your heart from beating it hit the first thing that it could find which was the top of your head that's what happens to light it can only excite surface molecules that comes back to the point that I was talking about earlier when I said you cannot cut like a saw because a saw is cutting lots of things at the same time this light beam can only work its way down gradually like a drill pecking away at creating chemical change exciting the molecules and making them disappear into something else as you cut through a material okay so here we've got a block of acrylic acrylic is a great material because it means we can see what's going on and what I've done I've set the speed and the power to cut cleanly through this piece of material and you will be able to see it cutting and the beam edge will look just like a saw in that it will go straight downwards just a very slight shape on that and look it's in two pieces at the moment that was done at five millimeters a second I'm going to change the speed up to around about eight millimeters a second you'll see that it's got a very rough cut along the bottom there where it hasn't gone all the way through now I'm not going to be I'm not going to try to explain that to you at the moment but what I do want you to look at is 
what's happened on the end of the cut. That it is a slight wedge shape. Wider at the top than it is at the bottom. Here's what we're doing. We've got a laser beam that's coming down to a focus point on the surface. And after the focus point, I've clearly demonstrated to you on these pieces of paper that after the focus point, the beam starts to grow. Just like that. So what do we think is going to happen when I fire this beam at this thick block of material? Now that's not what you expected, is it? It didn't do that. It's put a lovely straight hole right through that piece of 25 millimeter thick material. Now how did that happen? Why has that happened? That's one of the biggest conceptual problems that people wrestle with. That's not possible. Look, the beam should expand and we should disappear, the beam should disappear. I mean, to destroy that material down at the bottom there, I must be eroding, vibrating molecules. And I'm vibrating molecules a long way down from the focal point, 25 millimeters in fact. And yet the beam has not expanded. If it did, it wouldn't produce that shaped hole. And this is one of the biggest conceptual problems that you've got to wrestle with. Now I was showing you that this beam here, this cut, is not parallel. It's got a sort of a, a taper to it, a very thin taper to it. So, <clears throat> so by increasing the speed, I was changing the exposure time that the beam was allowed to work in the material. The longer I give the beam to work in the material, the deeper the cut. When I cut it at five millimeters a second, it was a lovely clean cut. When I cut it at eight millimeters a second, the cut didn't go all the way through. So there is this distinct relationship between power and speed, which, as I said, you must think of that as exposure time. Now with this hole, I did give it enough exposure time to burn right the way through 25 millimeters of material because I wasn't moving the head. So that was one example of how the exposure time works. But the biggest problem with this example, this parallel hole, is why am I producing a parallel hole that's that thin when I shouldn't because the beam is doing this? Okay, so this is where we need to begin to understand how all these concepts come together. Okay, let's backtrack to this picture. Now, as I said, the basic laser beam itself has not got a uniform distribution of power in it. And we had a demonstration of that with this little piece here where I expose this to the unfocused laser beam. The intense power at the centre of the beam evaporated this acrylic more than it did at the edge, where the power was lower. And look, you can see that. High power, more evaporation. Low power, less evaporation. Now when we put it through the lens and we squash it down to a very small spot size, as I've demonstrated to you here, that we can make, if we get it right, we can get the spot size, the focus point, very small. Let's just take this silly example of a six millimeter beam being compressed down to a 0 0.06 spot size. That's an amplification factor of 100. But it's going to finish up looking something like this, where that is 0.06 millimeters and this is the shape of that graph now. Now as I often said before my art teacher said to me make sure you take up plumbing boy. That is a graph of intensity. Remember that is the focal point there. This is not what's happening below the focal point. <laughs> This is the energy intensity at the focal point. The fact that I've drawn this down here gives the impression that this is some sort of magical drill 
that exists below the focal point. No. I keep emphasizing two things, exposure time and light intensity. The greater the light intensity, the more the damage you do. And here we've got an incredibly high light intensity. And look, I'll take you back to We come back to here, remember, light intensity at the centre is doing more damage than it is at the edge. The beam is not lower in the centre, it's just more intense, the light. And that's what we're talking about here, very high intensity light right at the centre of the beam. And that is what caused that hole. By holding it on long enough, this very intense light spike was able to do its job. So bear in mind, it can only damage solid material that it comes across. So it's gradually boring its way through that material, little by little, because of its intensity. This is a difficult concept for people to understand. Yes, this looks like a spiky drill that's below the focal point, but it's not. It is intensity at the focal point, and intensity equals damage. When we look at the other part that we looked at here, which was the cut that didn't go right the way through, that cut looks like this. Which is exactly the same as this example here, before we focused the beam. We've got exactly the same thing. We've got basically the shape of this spike here. The intensity at the focal point is so high that for a given time we can damage this depth. If we allow more time, what will happen is we'll be able to do that and do a complete cut. You certainly don't get any of this crap, <laughs> which I've seen on several websites. They try and explain why the edges of their cut are not straight. This is not the explanation. Look, this doesn't make any logical sense because if the beam is expanding like this it means that we're getting less energy we're getting lower intensity light and lower intensity light would actually not produce this shape or this shape <laughs> so you know this is an absolute ridiculous logical argument What I can do is to clearly show you this intense spike of energy that is down the center of the beam. I've used a very, very short focal length lens here. It's my what I call compound engraving lens. And what I'll do is I'll show you what this lens can do. It can produce very, very fine dots. So that's what happens when this beam goes out of focus. What we'll do, we'll set this up to the correct focus, which is about 11 millimeters, and I'll draw a line with it. All right, nice thin line. I'll now put it at least 10 millimeters out of focus. It's up there 20 plus a little bit. We'll draw another line. And there we go, a nice thick line. Now I'm not going to change the focus height at all. All I'm going to do is to change the speed. This is the original line. This is with it about 10 or 12 millimeters out of focus at 
something like about, the, well it's the same speed as that, but then I've upped the speed and look what's happened. I've decreased the exposure time by increasing the speed by a factor of four. You know, we're a long way out of focus. As I said, we're probably 12 millimeter out of focus and we should be seeing this thickness of line. But just by increasing the speed, we've managed to filter out all the excess power that was burning this line and we've just left the central high intensity core of the beam which is able to work at much higher speeds. More light intensity allows me to run faster and still do damage. Okay, it's not as much damage as that one, but you can see I've still got damage. And that proves my point that there is power down the center of that beam that projects way beyond the focal point. And it is that power right down the center of the beam that has caused that hole to be bored through 25 millimeters. I mean, let's try it with this very short focal length lens. And there we go. You can see it boring a hole slowly through there, but it got through eventually. So even though that's a very short focal length lens, it didn't produce a hole like that. The hole is not quite as parallel because I didn't allow it enough time to burn. Let's just give it a little bit more time. I think that's enough to give you a pretty good idea of what cutting is all about. I've covered all the basic points and then the last final conceptual point about this very high intense spot of light right at the center of the focal point which has the ability to do damage a long way below the focal point, but it all depends on this thing called exposure time. The lens has given you the intensity, the shape of your beam has given you the intensity right at the center of the spot or the focus point, but then its ability to do damage way below the focus point, well I've proven that beyond any doubt I think. But that's the conceptual difficulty that people have. They know that it cuts, but they don't understand why it cuts. I hope I've now made that clear to you. So, until the next time, cheers for now.